do. Y'all like the choir. Get y'all all all scoot to the front. I said, y'all got to all move to the front. There ain't nobody up here. (laughs) I'm glad y'all are here today celebrating Jesus Christ. Uh, If you'll look inside your bulletins, there's some announcements to be made. Leslie's going to make one right now. Leslie, get up there and make one of these announcements. Amen. Thank you so much. Also, um, you know, we have a lot of people who are sick right now. Uh, Brother Hilton is now, uh, as of yesterday, they moved him to the Baptist Hospital, and they're trying to wean him off his tracheotomy. It's not done yet, but uh, they, they're trying to. Uh, of course, remember, uh, we, have, we have a lot in the hospital, so it's best to just go by that list on back of there. We, we have a lot. And my mama had a, a, another little spell a Friday, and then last night my daddy had a little spell. So, um, so uh, remember Tedger, because that woman is working hard, and I'm scared she's going to wear out, and I'm going to have to get a new wife around here. What are you doing? <laughs> did, did y'all hear him gasp when I said that? <laughs> oh, I tell you what. No, no, y'all know I'm joking. That we, we, uh, <laughs> Tedger will watch it. She'll watch it. She'll beat me up later. Got to keep her gizzard from going dead. But uh, anyway, God's so good, and uh, so we had to go to the hospital on Friday, and uh, today we haven't had to go to the hospital yet, but uh, thank the Lord, we're in good shape. And a lot of our friends and neighbor from uh, our cross, Brother Ken Cause, he's having surgery on Tuesday. He's having a quadruple bypass. That'll be at Lady of the Lake Hospital. Uh, that's Ken Causey, so remember him in your prayers. And uh, Miss Pauline and Hilton and uh, all the rest of them that have been going through sickness and stuff. Give them a, give them a card, give them a, uh, just send them a prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, remember everything on our bulletin right here, and uh, we'll just continue on in worship. All right? Praise the Lord. All right, let's all join in our song service this morning, and let's sing number 544, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Let's stand together as we sing it. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have this morning, Lord. Lord, that we can come into your house, Lord, and to worship you this morning, Lord. The risen Savior, Lord, the name above all names that we look to. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would be here in our midst this morning, Lord. Because, Lord, if you're not here, Lord, it's just it's just dead this morning. But, God, we ask you that you come. We bind, ask you to bind Satan from these grounds, that you would have your way in our hearts this morning. God, there's all sorts of people here this morning. Lord, there's some lost. Lord, there's some that's backslidden. Some, Lord, that's having difficulties in their lives. Lord, we all face our challenges, Lord. 
But God, you're above all of them, Lord, this morning. And we just ask you to come this morning and move. Once again, we pray for those that are sick and suffering, Lord, in many different ways, Lord. We ask you this morning why we're able to be here to worship you this morning, that you would lift them up also, Lord. Lord, just encourage them, Lord, in truth and in spirit, Lord, that you're with them and that you'll never leave them or forsake them, no matter what trials we go through. Father, we just pray, Lord, today that everything that's done and said here, Lord, would be for your honor and your glory. God, remove us out of the way, Lord, and have your way in our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord? I tell you what, that first song got me fired up. I'm ready to go now. Sounds good. Y'all sound good this morning. Praise him. Praise him. Christian soldiers. And this will be our offertory hymn, so let's stand together again as we sing.
the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you've given us this past week. Lord, we thank you for keeping us safe, Lord, and we know, Lord, that we couldn't make it if it wasn't you, for, for you guiding us and leading us, Lord, from day to day. I ask you now, Lord, to be with us in our service this morning. We ask you to lead God and direct us in everything that we do, Lord, that it be done in accordance with your will. Lord, I pray for this time of our service that you would bless the gift and the giver. Lord, and may it be used to glorify your name. These things I ask in your name. Amen. <laughs> So y'all know Dave has been sick, right? So you hear that drum over there playing, y'all know a little bit. This is Casey, in case you didn't realize that. So Casey's the one up there playing that drum. I hope y'all, I'm, I'm enjoying it over there. I, I hear a difference in that style and everything. But uh, we appreciate him coming and filling in with his dad and stuff. And just a, a unique blessing. Appreciate him being here. Amen. Yeah. Eddie, you know what I'll say. Eddie says, he's better looking Dave is. <laughs> he just took the words out of my mouth. I was fixing, I was fixing to recognize Casey over there on them drums. I tell you what, he sounded good, didn't
Miss Ruth is going to come do our special for us this morning. And it's an old when, when he rains. Yeah, it come out of my old box of songs, so I don't even know if I've sung it here. I may have. I can't remember, but it's, it's a pretty song. I think the younger people will probably like the beat of it the best. Israel walked the desert for 40 years. They wandered all around. They cried out to God in all their hunger. And they knew when the man who came down, when he ran, when he ran, said for he could open up heaven's door and shower. Heart can't even store when he rains. It pours. There were five thousand on the hillside, and a multitude were waiting to be fed. Now folks still wonder how he filled them. Just two fish and five loaves of bread. When he rains, he pours. He will open up heaven's door and shower out a blessing your heart can't even store. When he rains, it pours. Once you have come to know the Savior. Once you've been washed in the blood, prepare your heart to overflowing, cause it's about to come flood, oh yeah. When he rains, it Can't even store when he rains it pours and shower out a blessing. Your heart can't even store when he rains. When he rains, oh, when he rains it pours. Oh yeah, you better believe it. You'll open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. So this will probably be something that none of y'all have. So I guess I'm going to be preaching to the choir. So this will be something that you can use for them other churches and everything that don't quite have this down pat yet. All right? Luke chapter 17, let's look at verse 3. If you can stand with me. We're going to read the word of God. This is your answer. This is your help. Get your pen out. We're going to mark this. Luke chapter 17, verse 3. It says, be on your guard. If your brother sins, and watch this, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, 
I repent. Watch this. Forgive him. The apostle said to the Lord, now, I want you to catch this. Don't, don't you think it's interesting right here when you go to those two verses? And then you get right here, and it says, the apostle said to the Lord, right here on this part, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the seed, and it would obey you. Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he has come in from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat? But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you may eat and drink? He does not thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded does he? So you too, when you do all things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Let's use that as the words that we're going to be preaching on today. Father, we thank you, God, for the holy word. I thank you, Father, that, Lord, throughout our lives that you have given us direction. I thank you, Father, that we have opportunity to hear the word today. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ, so many of our friends and family, Lord, our loved ones have been sick and going through issues, but Father, we thank you that they're never alone and that we're never alone. I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts today. Have your will and way. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray it. Amen. You know, so I've, I've been kind of pondering this as different situations happen and stuff, and, and as I was looking at this scripture, some of the wor voices and the words right here just kind of jumped off the page and started just kind of catching my my attention. You know, bitterness is, is kind of like a malignancy. You know, it's something that gets into your life and it really sours you. Now, I'm, I'm confident that most of you have never even had something like this. But you know, some of us have been through things in our lives where there's things that happen where we get bitter. And what happens when you get bitter, it starts making everything around it sour too. It, it's intense. It's something that's inside of you. Uh, any of you ever have indigestion? That's where the acid starts rolling up in your guts and they, they start giving you little pills to kind of calm that acid down. So what I'm telling you, in our lives, if you're not careful, you can let things come up that make you sour. They make you bitter. And what you need is the Holy Spirit to give you the wisdom to calm that stuff down, to get rid of it, to remove it from your life. See, when you get bitter and you get sour in life, it has consequences that are far greater than just what you think. When it starts affecting your emotional, how you look at things, how you see this world out here. And it starts affecting your health, believe it or not. It starts giving you uh, a spiritual kind of indigestion. I even read an article years ago about a particular fellow who was just having these severe migraines. And they were so severe that the only thing he could do was take heavy narcotics to get rid of it. It would put him in a room, and he would have to turn out all the lights, and he'd have to close all the curtains, and it had to be total blackness because his head hurt him so bad. So he actually started going to a counselor to try to deal with it because he didn't like all these narcotics that he was having to take. And as he was going up there, what the counselor found out that a lot of what he was dealing with was a result of things that he was carrying from past. You see, it seems he had been divorced over 20 years earlier. And in that divorce, he had developed a hatred. He had went through a really bad, bad divorce, and they were angry, and every single issue from the children to property to everything they dealt with, even the dogs they had fought about. And it had left him so bitter that he, even 20 years later, was still holding on to that problem back there. Even though he had been divorced all those years, he was still looking behind him out of this pain. Now, what was even worse is in this is the counselor found out that the woman had been dead for 10 years. So even though she had been dead, he's still packing this weight. And the counselor had went to him and says, Listen, man, uh, it doesn't do you any good when you have some kind of bitter feelings to want somebody who's alive. But when somebody has already passed, what good is all this bitterness doing you? How is it helping your life? So this man actually took and started looking at what was taking place in his life. And through the power of the Word of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, he was delivered and set free from the bondage of the change that he was carrying with him. Matter of fact, when he went through this, God not only set him free of holding that hatred towards somebody who had passed away, 
He set him free from that headache. Well, as he went, the further he went, the further the, the pain in his head went away. Isn't that interesting when you find out that things like that affect your health, affect your life? So in Luke chapter uh, 17 right here, we see where Jesus is coming up his, to his disciples, and what he's doing is he's in, instructed them with some, some suggestions on how to deal with anger, how to deal with this bitterness that can get inside your gizzard and start making you sour towards people. So the Lord talks about that we should handle it in certain ways, and one of the ways is we should handle this bitterness in ourselves in an aggressive, and, but also have to be courageous in dealing with the situation. It's an alternative to what the world says. It's an alternative to what all the other religions of the world says. God gives us instructions that are totally different. So one of the things the Bible encourages us to do is to go forth to the somebody who's done something against you and you feel that they've wronged you. He says, go to them in a loving way. Now, that's not the typical pattern that we like to use. When something happens to us, the typical pattern is, is we tell them to bop them upside the head. We tell them to go over there and strike back at them. But what it says, that not only should you do it lovingly, but you should do it in a truthful manner. You should go and confront them with the situation of how you feel about it. So what this passage does is it gives the person that's been offended, the party that's, that has this hurt in their life, the responsibility for the open communication with the individual that hurts you. But what is our tendency to do? When somebody hurts us, what do we do? Do we go to that individual the way Scripture does? Do we go to that individual and say, you know what, that hurt my feelings? You see, we take it as a sign of weakness. God says it's a, a sign of strength. See, everything in the Word of God has always went against what the world tells you. But we're still grabbing hold of what the world says, and we say, well, this is the way we should deal with it. So you wonder why the churches have the problems we do. It's because the situation is we take Oprah over the power of the Word of God. We take the psychologist from off the TV channels or your computers and stuff, over the Holy Spirit giving us instructed instructions and teaching us the truthful way to go. So some of these, if you look back, is some of the New Testament scriptures, what it does is it requires a person who's created the offense to initiate it. So you think, well, okay, so one's telling the one who's been offended, the other's saying the one who, who did it should go and bring it together. So what you have to do is you take and you combine this message. If you want to make a good gumbo, some always ask, well, how do you make gumbo? I said, well, you take everything and you blend it correctly. So you take the Word of God and you combine this, and what happens is it's telling us that two mature Christians, two born-again believers, when they realize that there is something in their lives that's breaching their, their spiritual brother and sister relationship, that, that they should go towards each other. That they should walk like me and you. Old, anybody ever have an old friend on the road and, uh, years ago when you was a little kid, and you would walk just literally just miles to go see that friend on one of these old clay roads or something like that, and you'd kind of find them meeting you about halfway? How about this? This is what the Word's telling you, that literally you should meet each other going because each one of you realize as mature Christians that there's a problem and approach each other in a loving way and just deal with the situation. But what usually happens is the opposite. What usually happens is, is we start dealing with it by the power of the phone or something else. Now they use the uh, computers a lot to, to just gossip or talk bad about each other. Against it goes totally against what the Scripture says. But if you want to resolve the problem, if you want the problem healed, we've got to take the Word of God as a truth. You know, I was thinking, so you can take like grain. <laughs> now some of you are going to snicker at this, but this is what comes to my brain. And you can take the same grain that you make bread with, that you can make uh, pies with, you can take that same kind of grain and you can put it in a bucket and you can sour it. Now when you sour it, some of you hopefully don't do this anymore, no it becomes what they call a sour mash. Now I don't know if you've ever had this, but I used to have, you know, I deal with a lot of people and stuff, I used to have guys that made moonshine. Now, I know y'all have never dealt with that over here in Mississippi. I'm confident of that because that's just something they'd do down in them swamps in Louisiana and stuff. But they'd make that moonshine, and even though it looked clear and it looked like water, it wasn't. It was never totally clear. It always had a fuzzy look to it because of the alcohol content. 
And the same grain that could make bread, the same grain that could feed your body, the same grain that can make you alive, you can take this fermented grain that's soured inside of a bucket and it can make you dizzy. It can burn the inside of you. One of my, you know, I, I had years ago, uh, I've had this a problem with my liver. And the doctor told me, he says, now, do you drink? I said, well, no, I don't drink. I'm a Baptist preacher. He says, that don't mean nothing. I said, obviously, you belong to a Baptist church. He says, I want to tell you something, what people don't realize. He says, people tell you all the time that you should have a glass of wine. He says, I'm here to tell you, as soon as you take just that swallow of that wine, multi-millions of your cells inside your liver, which, believe me, is a very important organ in your body, are killed when you receive it. I said, well, the heart doctors all say it's good for you. He said, but they're not looking at the whole picture. They're looking at one particular situation. He says, you get the same benefit from unfermented grape juice as what you would with something with alcohol in it. He says, now I'm going to tell you this, it goes further than that. And he went through a whole list of all the damages that's done to your mind and your body from just that alcohol, which is actually, listen to this, the reason you get what you think is happy when you're drinking alcohol is because it's poisoning you. Did you know that? You're actually, when you drink that alcohol, it's poisoning your body. Now, this is not nothing to it. This is all free, so this don't count against my time, so don't even start your time. <coughs> this, is, this is things that are destructive to your body. Well, think about bitterness. When we let bitterness get inside of us, and we think we're doing something to somebody else, what you're actually doing is souring something that should be good. See, when the Holy Spirit fills you, there should be a joy and a peace that passes understanding. But what happens when you're angry at somebody? What happens when you, when you resent somebody? What happens when you feel hurt by somebody? How's your sleep go that night? Do you go to sleep like, oh, man, this is the best sleep I've had in just months and years? No. What do you do? You sit up and focus on it. Here's the next thing. So when it sours into you, you will do stuff kind of like you do on alcohol. You do things you normally wouldn't do. You say things you normally wouldn't say. And you have problems. And you can wreck your car. And you can get in trouble. Just because we let something sour in our system. So what Christ does, he comes to us and he tells us that we should, if this happens to us, the Lord said seven times is not enough to forgive somebody. It should even be more than that. That same person who's, in, and what happens is we come up and say, no, Brother Blaine, you don't understand. It says even in another scripture, it says 70 times seven. It, it multiplies it over. Jesus says we're to forgive the individual who hurt us. Uh, I'm just, now here's what, here's what I've actually heard out of somebody's mouth. I'm just not made that way. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You might look at that one way and say, well, my family's tough, my family's rough, and we go over there and we punch it out. I'm going to tell you what you're actually telling me. I want you to listen to me because this could accidentally be offensive. Now, I don't mean it to be, but you're probably lost. You hearing me? See, we're dealing with the eternal, and what you're saying is you're not a new creation of Christ. Won't you listen to me? What you're saying is, is that God does not control your life. Now, some of you are going to spit that out and walk on down the road and say, that's just a knothead preacher. I never liked him in the first place. That's okay. That's all right. Jesus says that we're to forgive him with a, the, the same infinite grace that we're forgiven by God. So here's, here's what you've got to come to. So what's that mean? So how many times has God forgiven you? I want you to think about it. How many times has God forgiven me for my thoughts and my actions? I've heard so many times this statement, you know, well, you don't know what they did to me, Brother Blaine. You don't know how this made me and how this affected my family. See, that's a whole misunderstanding of the serious issue that we're dealing with right here. You see, the bitterness that grows from that seeds of in unforgiveness, it, it produces the deadly poison. It's an alcohol poisoning. 
that's coming into your life. And what it does, so what does that poisoning do? So I was out there the other day, and I was getting all them lovely seeds. Sometimes last week, week before, I've been getting them, them clay mountains in the yard. Y'all, any of y'all getting them big clay hills in the yard? Called fire ants. So I go out there, and I'm spreading this stuff out there, this ortho stuff. I go on, I put it all over the place. And you know what it does to that nest? It kills it. Now, here's what's more interesting. This sounds terrible. But y'all know I'm just as plain. Uh, it ain't much to me. I was looking out the other day. I killed two birds with one stone. Guess what was eating them dead ants? The crows. Guess what I got? I killed the ants and I killed the crows. I told Tedra, pick me up a couple more bags of that stuff. I want you to think about it. See, when we have this resentment in our lives, what it does is sometimes we even pass it on to the generations behind us, giving reasons of why or excuses why we can dislike somebody. And all that poisoning, so it doesn't only just affect me, it affects the people who surround me, and it affects later generation. And what it does, it destroys me, and it can destroy your whole family. So... You ever recognize, like, just what it happens when we start getting bitter in our lives? Have you ever understood, have you ever listened to people? You can hear it, not in this church. It would be some other church, something like that. might be one in Franklin County Church. It ain't there. Right, I just want you to know that. I know you're visiting, so it ain't over here. But what happens is, is you can start seeing people just inside the church, and they get cynical, and they get critical, and they start getting a really harsh tongue. You ever heard that said? Have you ever had somebody say, well, you know, they have just such a harsh tongue. And, and they, let me tell you something. What you've got to recognize is that is the problem. Inside of them is this bitter poisoning that's taking place in their life. I told you this illustration before, but since y'all visiting from Franklin County, I'm going to tell you, you might have heard it because y'all been here several times before. So listen to this. So I used to have a dog. They've all heard it, so this is just for y'all. So I used to have a dog, and he's part... German Shepherd, and he was part beagle. It's a beautiful dog. Strangest thing you've ever seen in your life. But that dog was really big, and it was really healthy. But one day I seen that dog out there, and it was dragging its back legs. And the reason it was dragging its back legs is because, and I went out there, I thought, I said, I didn't know what was wrong with it. I thought it had some kind of terrible disease, one of them puppy diseases or something like that. I didn't know what was wrong with it. I said, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to shoot this thing. If I go out there, and, and I look at it, and I think, I, I never thought about taking him to a vet. I ain't never thought about that. I was thinking about putting a 22 in his head. Ain't that awful? <coughs> but I went out there, and, and I noticed that he had a, a tick on him. And that tick had bit him in the spine, and in that spine, that poisoning had numbed his whole back quarters. Now, here's the thing. When that particular problem that particular uh, pestilence was removed from the animal. Just within just a short period of time, that dog that I thought I was going to have to shoot was up and running around and healed. See, we don't understand a lot of times that we're seeing the symptoms of a bitterness in our hearts. And we don't realize it's paralyzing us spiritually. It's affecting our thought processes. You know, people that get through this all the time, they get hurt all the time, you know what they do? Is they start looking at everybody around them that everybody's that way. Everybody's out to hurt them. Everybody's out to take something from them. Everybody's out there doing something. People that way, you got a parasite. And it's sucking your spiritual welfare out of you. And it has to be removed. You got to put it far from you. You got to be aggressive with it. It talks about in verses 5 through 9 right there that we should forgive because, look, because you want to be obedient to the one who saved you. So are you a child of God? Have you been forgiven by, by the blood of the Lamb? Has, has Jesus Christ, have you surrendered it all to him? It, it, we don't forgive because we just feel like it. It's not because I, I, I just want to do it. It's because God told me to do it, and I want to be obedient to my master. Now, we don't like saying that a lot. But see, 
We're supposed to be the slaves of Christ. So the disciples, they responded to this commandment of Jesus by saying this one thing. And it's so incredible to me. They said, no, Lord, increase our faith. Don't you think that's strange when you read that? I look at that, see, because we're saying uh, increase our faith. They, they weren't saying that they couldn't do it. They weren't saying that it wasn't possible. But what they were saying is that God was going to have to empower them to be able to do it. To give them the strength to do it. To give them the unction to do it. See, Christ indicates that the real issue here is, is in our faith. It's not my faith issue, but what it truly comes down to is obedience. We look at our children, we get so frustrated with our children. But see, we're like that. It's whether we're going to be obedient to the word of Christ or not. It's whether I'm going to let him discipline me. Since we, the older you get, the less we want to listen. And God wants us to listen. You want to know something? Study the word of God. Be obedient to the word of God. Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. You hear it all the time. He says, if you love me. It's not because he's got you chained down. It's because you care. You love him. You know, it, it's, it's about a servant who returns, you know, in, in the scriptures here, it, it talks about that servant who returns from, from working hard all day in the fields. And they've been working out there right alongside of the master. But here it is, the servant goes in there who's been sweating and working right there next to the master. His job is to go in there and to prepare the meal for the master. To go, even though he's tired, even though he, he's hungry, even though he has a, a desire to, to, to get things, you know, done in his life, other stuff. He says, no, the master comes first. The servant didn't feel like it, but he did it anyway. See, sometimes you don't feel like forgiving somebody. Sometimes you don't feel like going and getting things right. Sometimes you think it's everybody else's responsibility. But what it's telling you is that it's your duty as a child of the king to get things right. As a servant of God, it's our job to forgive somebody. That's right. It's labor you got to work at it. you got to work at it. you got to do this if you're going to see the power of God manifest in your life. It's not an option. Nowhere in this scripture do you see that as an option. So I would say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, as long as you do it my way. And God's saying you've been doing it, you've been doing it long enough your way. What it's time to do is to do it the master's way. He's saying, this is how you do it. And you don't get an option. It's not, well, well Lord, what if I, what if I, what if I do, you know, I, I guess say I take two steps and, and make them take two steps. You know, if they're a child of God, they should be running out there and meet you in the first place. But here's the deal. Don't be dependent upon them. Be dependent upon your relationship with Christ. See, we should forgive out of obedience to God himself, not because the offender deserves it, not because, you know, they've done something to, to really know their, their position or something th like that. It's nothing in this passage that relates to the person's worthiness to be forgiven. It's not because it's just your family member. It's not just because... They hold a position of power. It's because it's right. That's what God's telling us. God doesn't gauge the forgiveness of, a, a, of sinful humanity. Someone like me, by my worthiness, by what I'm doing as a pastor, it, I'm so thankful it's not based upon that. It's not anything like that. See, the demanding master, he may deserve to be served. And that overworked servant, he may deserve to be abused. Nonetheless, what it says in the Word, 
is that the servant quietly lives out his servanthood. See, that's what I think is so interesting. You don't see him complain. You don't see him whimper. You don't see him saying, why? You know what he says? Nothing. He just goes and does it. See, as a child of the king, that ought to be our manifestation. That ought to be what motivates us is that I go and I love on somebody because that's my mandate. The Christian goes through life forgiving people. If you want to have a life that doesn't suffer from different illnesses, you should be a forgiver. Even though so, so somebody offends me, what it does is I, I forgive them, and what it shows is, is that manifestation of somebody that they can witness grace. So what is grace? Unmerited, undeserved favor. Grace is something you didn't earn. Grace is something that you can't pay for. Grace is given to you by God. And this is what he's saying. The same way I measure it out to you, you need to measure it out to other people. <coughs> now think about that for a little while. Think about that. So after all, all grace, it's is by its very definition, when you understand it's not deserved. What God does, he didn't pick me out for my position as in saying, well, that's what you deserve. What he says is, I love you. And everybody's equal. Grace is poured out on Donald Trump, a billionaire, the same way it's poured out upon someone like you. In that verse 10, it says one of the things that you need to look at. Uh, it says, so, so you too, when you do all things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. See, this is actually important right here. A lot of times we look past this part of the scriptures <coughs> and we kind of take it for granted. But what it's saying is that we should forgive without being proud about it. See, that's one of the dangers right here. See, there's this, this subtle kind of pride that can start developing when we forgive somebody. It can start swelling up. It's, it's an attitude towards that person that we forgive. And it, it's like, you know, I've forgiven you, you rotten sinner. I forgave you. You're so blessed. You're so fortunate. Someone like me was willing to, with everything you've done to me, you're so blessed. See, what it's saying is I'm so much more spiritual than you are. I'm so much more spiritual than you. And what happens is, is we start slipping into that lane, and whether we like it or not, what we start doing is, is we start getting that Pharisaic attitude. We start becoming, start banging on our chest about the self-righteousness. Look at me. Did y'all know I forgave so-and-so? I forgave them. Look at me. I'm super spiritual preacher, man. What happens is it starts robbing you. And we have the appearance of what it talks about in the Word of God as the Pharisees who banged on their chest. The same God who forgave me says, I should be willing to forgive others in the same way. So now, now here's something that's so important here. There's some, there's some really big reasons why not to be bitter. See, we forgive for Jesus' sake. It's, it's an act of, of devotion for my love of Jesus Christ, and we forgive others for, for, for my sake. It's bitterness is, is so destructive in my life, and forgiveness for their sake. Because forgiveness is God's love following through us to affect others. As I forgive them, I'm showing the love of Jesus Christ. So as you study this particular scripture here, one of the things you need to look at right here is, is how God forgives us. Think about how God forgave you. No one else knows what your life is or what's happened or what hasn't happened. Think about if you're a child of God and you repent of your sins, think how God has forgiven you. Now look at this. Now think about how you forgive your debtors. What if we did what scripture says and, and, you know, it says, and forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. What if it was measured out to us, that kind of forgiveness? Exactly how would that be in your life? See, that's what's important.
God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And he looked at me with all my wretchedness and all my evil and sin. And when I said, Lord, I am lost and I'm hopeless. Forgive me, Lord. And with everything that I've done, everything that I used to be, all my previous attitudes and actions, and he says, I'll die for you and I'm going to take your debt. So, I bought a truck the other day. I've been driving my truck for 21 years. Some of y'all know I'm kind of frugal. Yeah. His pain. They was even laughing at me at the dealership. So I've acquired debt. And I'm going to tell you something. I hate debt. Any debt. Strange. But think of this. Somebody coming up to you when you buy a new vehicle and saying, I'll take that. How would you react? You buy a house. And someone says, I'll take that. I'm going to pay that off for you. See, we look at that and we say, oh, man, I get so excited. It's the same thing. When you gave God your sins, you had this debt that you could not pay. And I don't know about you, I hate it. I hate debt. And God comes in there and he says, I'm going to take it all. And I'm not going to hold it against you. My son's going to pour out all his blood so that your sin can be wiped away. You think about how you'd get excited about somebody paying for you a truck. Somebody paying for you a house. Now think about somebody paying for your eternity. And tell me you can't shout about that. Because if you can't shout about that, you ain't got no shout in you at all. If you could bow your heads for just a moment. Brother Raymond M is going to come down. We're going to play an altar call song. The same one. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I'd surely fail. Without him, I would be drifting like a ship without a sail. Today, if you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ, I want to give you an invitation that will change your eternity by giving your life to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what age you are. That don't save you. It don't matter how good you think you've been. That don't save you. It don't matter how much money you put in the plate. That don't save you. It's by saying, Lord, forgive me. I am a lost sinner, and I ask you to save me. That is a decision that you need to make. Maybe you've been under bondage of having some things in your life where you've been hurt. I dare to say that sitting out here, there's multitudes of people that have been hurt. All of us at different times, I may kind of tell little jokes and stuff to lighten the moment. But the truth is, we carry a burden sometimes. And it's a burden you don't have to carry. It's a weight that you don't have to keep with you. Let me ask you, how long are you going to keep dragging that thing around? When are you going to lay your burdens down? Today, these altars are open up front. Maybe you want me to pray with you, pray for somebody, pray for somebody else's salvation or deliverance. Maybe you just want me to pray with you. When we have an altar call, you are more than welcome to come. And listen, we've got Brother Ellis sitting right down here too. There's more than enough preachers to go around here a few dozen times. Brother Sadler's here. We've got lots of <laughs> preachers. All you've got to do is come. God wants to meet you where you're at. Won't you come this morning as they sing? Without him I could do nothing. That's right. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting. Like 
like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus, oh Jesus. this next verse won't y'all sing with me without him i could be dying that's right without him i'd be enslaved without him i would be hopeless but with jesus Thank God I'm, I'm saved. saved. Hallelujah. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus. Without him, how lost I would be. Without him, I could do nothing. Without him, I surely fail. Without him, I would. Like a ship without a sail. Jesus, oh Jesus, do you know him today? Do not turn him away, oh Jesus. Oh, Jesus, without him, how lost I would be. Father, we thank you so much that we can be here today by the grace of God to be in your presence, to feel your love and your compassion. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for, Lord, being forgiving to us. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will give us a heart like that. Give us eyes, Lord, with compassion. And, Lord, that we can forgive those who've hurt, wounded us, trespassed. For, Father, we know so many times in our lives that we've done that against you. And you've always forgiven us, God. So, Lord, we claim it in the name of Jesus, the word of God. And we pray, for Lord, as we walk this old world, that we'll be an example to others of grace. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. <laughs>